we're going to be talking about the microcytic anemias. We arrived here because our patient had the symptoms of anemia. We checked his CBC, the hemoglobin was low. We looked at the MCV, and the MCV was less than 80. Microcytic anemia, we confirmed with reticulocyte index, which is low. To talk about microcytic anemias, we first have to review what we know so far from this course about heme synthesis and iron regulation. Normal adult hemoglobin consists of two alpha chains and two beta chains, forming a tetramer. This is alpha 2, beta 2, or hemoglobin A1. We're going to represent that by two blue circles and two empty green circles, because we're going to combine those, this four globin structure each one of the globins is going to get a heme molecule, which is a porphyrin ring encircling iron. We add these things together, and what we get is a tetramer of alpha 2 and beta 2, each globin associated with its own heme molecule. From the iron regulation standpoint, we're going to do this both with physiology and my iron silos. Iron regulation physiology begins with the duodenal enterocyte. It has on it a transporter called ferroportin, which allows iron that has been pulled in from the diet into the bloodstream. But the body doesn't like having iron just in the serum. And so it has a protein, a protein called transferrin, which acts as the iron carrier through the bloodstream. Each of these seats can house an iron. And through the blood, transferrin, the iron transport protein, sends iron to tissues. The liver is the site where iron is stored. Stored iron is called ferritin. When the liver has a robust supply of iron, it feels the system is good and does not make any more transferrin. But that it's the liver responsibility when in times of need for more iron, it makes more transferrin. You'll see how I'm color coding these in a second for a particular purpose. In addition, there is macrophages, which are responsible for degrading red blood cells, breaking down hemoglobin, sending off globin to its constitutive parts, breaking down the heme ring. The heme becomes bilirubin, the porphyrin ring, and iron. And iron can either be stored within itself or released through ferroportin. Regulation is at the level of hepcidin. Hepcidin, when secreted, inhibits the action of ferroportin and keeps iron from entering the bloodstream. The liver synthesizes hepcidin. The things that increase hepcidin's production, that inhibits iron entering the bloodstream, is the presence of iron. Iron stimulates hepcidin and inhibits iron entry. The other thing that does that is inflammation via interleukin-6. The idea being, in an acute infection, bacterial cells need iron. Our cells need iron, but our cells have a host organism which can protect our cells for a few days without iron. Bacteria cannot. The problem comes, though, when interleukin-6 is expressed chronically and there is no acute infection that will end, as we'll see. Hepcidin's production is inhibited by erythropoietin. When the kidney says, make me some more red blood cells, it, those red blood cells are going to need hemoglobin and need iron, so EPO turns off hepcidin. The other thing that turns off hepcidin is hypoxemia. EPO 
is how the kidney senses for hypoxemia. Hypoxemia also negatively impacts sepsidin at the level of the liver. This is how you should be able to explain all the diseases that involve iron. I've simplified it for you. And so I recommend you also do it with the iron silo and we'll do both. The iron silo's mechanism is set up such that it is like a grain silo. Except unlike a grain silo, the iron input is essentially fixed. It's a trickle. At the bottom here is a hose connected to a valve. That valve is hepcidin. If hepcidin is activated, clockwise it goes, the hose clamps down, no iron exits into the blood. Hepcidin is low, counterclockwise, the valve opens, and all the iron stores rush out. The amount of iron in doesn't change. Now, the amount of iron in is dependent on hepcidin, but relative to the amount of red blood cells you can lose in bleeding, or relative to the demand of the marrow, it's essentially fixed. The amount of iron stored in the iron silo, the stored iron in red to match ferritin in our drawing over here, the stored iron is ferritin. The remaining iron that could be stored in the silo, the total remaining capacity, the total iron binding capacity, is the same thing as transferrin. We're also going to discuss the percent saturation, though I don't personally use this in practice. And this is not percent saturation of hemoglobin by oxygen, it's a percent saturation of transferrin by iron. And lastly, the iron that's in the blood is represented by iron. That's our introduction and overview of what we learned so far. Let's start off with iron deficiency anemia. In iron deficiency anemia, there is an increased demand for erythropoiesis beyond what the intake of iron can sustain. This comes in the form of chronic slow bleeds. Now this is not acute hemorrhage that result in reticulocytosis. The patient doesn't know there's a problem until they run out of iron. The other thing that can cause this is an increased demand for erythropoiesis. The patients are going to be those with menorrhagia, that is heavy menses, the increased demand to replace those red blood cells that are lost, and those who are pregnant. Mom's blood volume and blood increases and baby needs iron to make its hemoglobin. Anyone who is a postmenopausal female, but any male presenting with iron deficiency anemia who has no reason to be bleeding, is assumed to have colon cancer until proven otherwise. The male presentation of iron deficiency anemia is colon cancer, get a colonoscopy. Also for the exam, watch out for things like plumber vinson syndrome, esophageal webs, esophageal cancer, dysphagia, and iron deficiency anemia. The only diagnosis that you can make with a CBC, RBC parameters alone is iron deficiency anemia. If you have a very low MCV, or I'm talking less than 70, and a high RDW, the diagnosis is made. But the correct way to diagnose iron deficiency anemia is with iron studies. Let's go through this process. Iron deficiency anemia, increased erythropoiesis, lots of EPO, the bone marrow is saying, give me iron. In that instance, the iron stores are going to be used because not enough iron from the diet can trickle in. So which means that the liver stores are going to be consumed to maintain production. Production only ceases when the iron reserves run out. That means when they run out, there's going to be a low iron. But because the iron stores are depleted, ferritin is low. Because ferritin is low, the, the liver thinks, oh no, there's not enough iron. I know what I'll do. I'll send out more transferrin. That must be what the issue is. And so the transferrin increases. The transferrin is reported as the TIBC. Because there's not a lot of iron in the serum total, and there's an increase in transferrin, the percent saturation falls. Let's do it again with the iron silo. 
The iron silo has a fixed amount in, it's a small trickle. The body is demanding iron, give me iron. Hepcidin is off. The hose at the bottom is maximally opened. Any of the iron reserves would be released. The problem is that all the iron's been used up. So there's no iron left in the stores to make it to the bloodstream. That means there is a low iron, a low ferritin, and all this space left over in elevated TIBC, which is the same thing as here. Iron deficiency anemia, find the source of the bleed, stop it, give them iron. Compare iron deficiency anemia to anemia of chronic disease. Now I'm going to write anemia of chronic disease because that's the name of the disease, but you know already that this is anemia of chronic inflammatory disease. You do not have anemia of chronic hypertension and you don't have the disease of chronic bipolar disorder. It has to be in...